All right. Hello, everyone. Hope you guys are having a good time here. This is the third session today. Uh, I have here with me Michael Smith, a product manager from Box.net. How many of you know Box.net? Awesome. Sure. So Box.net has lots of uh, cool applications that they do on both uh, mobile applications and standalone. And while doing that, they deal with a lot of complexities with cloud and devices and various things. And today we have uh, Michael here who will walk through some of the complexities that they, that they have to work through and how they solve them and, and gives us tips and, and, and uh, pointers that we can start looking at. Michael. Cool. Thanks. So yeah, so I'm a product manager at box.net. I'm going to talk a little bit about our experiences with uh, mobile in the cloud. Um, so yeah, I'm a product manager at Box, uh, but I started off doing application development for our iOS applications, so I built our iPhone and our iPad apps. Um, so what's Box? Looks like most people here were familiar with it, but uh, we try to make it easy to share, manage, and access your content uh, from anywhere. And uh, I'm part of that uh, from anywhere piece. Um, so just some quick statistics on the service. Uh, we have 7 million users, 77% of the Fortune 500, and some use Box in some form. And uh, we have 100,000 businesses on our platform. So let me show you just a quick uh, video of uh, our, our iPad application. We have an iPhone app. We have Android apps for both tablets and phones. Uh, we have a Playbook application and a touchpad application. So let me see if the, the audio plays. We tested it earlier. How do I? OK, so that's what our iPad app does. And actually, today, uh, starting today, we're running a promo. And if you download the application, you get 50 gigs of storage forever for free. Um, but I guess wait till the end. <laughs> um, yeah, so what do people use uh, our application for? Um, there's a ton of use cases uh, around kind of on-the-go access to, to content. Um, we have use cases where. Sales representatives will actually give presentations off of uh, their, their iPad or their Android tablet. Um, for example, TaylorMade Golf. Uh, we have employees uh, at Dole using uh, the iPads in pineapple fields. And um, you know, we're having executives replace paper binders with, uh, with the iPad application uh, so that they don't have to print paper as much. And so all of these use cases would be impossible without access to a server somewhere else. So uh, after that introduction, uh, I want to give you guys just uh, um, a rundown of our experiences building the Box applications, uh, the problems that we faced, and kind of some of the solutions that we found. So first, I want to talk a little bit about uh, workflow. So. Some apps can stand alone. So a lot of games, you know, Angry Birds, all of the interaction happens within the application. Um, so it may not need cloud connectivity. Uh, but many applications, uh, social apps, business apps, 
um, even some games, need to exist as part of a, a bigger story. So your application doesn't stand alone. It actually exists as part of uh, a broader ecosystem of applications that allow users to complete some set of tasks. So, um, you know, users really expect changes uh, in your application to be visible across the web, integrated applications, uh, and the desktop. And that information needs to be in sync all the time. Uh, at Box, we've actually done some surveys uh, and, and looked at our data. And we've actually seen that users, on average, access our uh, platform from six different locations, uh, which is a crazy amount, if, if you think about it. Um, so that's computers and mobile phones and other applications uh, other than the main box website. So having your application accessible from different locations is, is more important than ever. So as you can see just from this, uh, this flow, um, a typical workflow on Box would be somebody opens up the Box iPad application. Uh, they want to edit the document in QuickOffice, uh, and they want that change to be uploaded back to Box. And then they want somebody else to edit that document from the web. And then somebody else needs to edit it from the desktop. And then that same person later on wants to come back and view the document in Goodreader. And so you have all of these kind of access points for information. Uh, that, that you need to uh, make available. So just from a user's perspective, um, people want access to uh, the same set of content <laughs> from, from any application, from any website, from any cloud service, from any desktop. And they want it to just work seamlessly. So no matter... Uh, where, when, or how somebody last touched their information or they last touched their information, it needs to be ready and available from any other app. And so they want it to be accessible from Goodreader, from Google Apps, from QuickOffice. And that makes a lot of sense. Unfortunately, the, the reality of the situation is that things really look like this, right? So. You have applications talking to each other. You have applications talking to separate databases on different services. Uh, you have websites talking to applications. You have websites talking to different sources of information. Um, I don't know if you guys saw, but Spotify you know, recently rolled out on the right-hand side of, of the application you know, Facebook uh, information. So you know, it's just one example of users wanting information and access to information from other apps. Um, from other databases. So how do you kind of make sense of that whole alphabet soup? And how do you make sure that you're taking advantage of all of the mechanisms of, of communication to communicate back down to um, your database and, and your server? So I've kind of broken it out into the, the three forms of, of interaction between applications that, that we've seen. So there's communication uh, between your app and other apps on the device. So those happen through device APIs, and we'll go through some of those. Um, there's the web APIs, which allow you to communicate with uh, other cloud services. And then there's uh, in-application web views that you can actually use to render content from your website or other websites. So I'm also going to focus mainly on iOS and Android, because those are kind of the two uh, most popular platforms right now. So, so to start, let's talk a little bit about device APIs. Um, they allow you to pass information between apps or uh, request information from other apps. Um, so they're great for launching applications that can help your app out. Uh, so functionality that you don't necessarily want to build, but uh, exist in some other application developers' um, uh, world. Uh, you can help enable that, that workflow I talked about earlier within the device. And uh, you can actually get users into your application from like a website like Safari uh, or an email application. So just to give a quick example of something that, that we've implemented, um, is uh, open in on iOS, and this is a way of passing content between applications. So iOS actually gives you uh, the ability to 
request a list of applications that can open a certain document type uh, on the device. So for example, let's say um, you're building a document viewer. You're looking at a PowerPoint, but you want to edit it. So we don't provide editing capability, but an application called QuickOffice does. So we can ask the operating system, hey, what applications does the user have installed that will make it possible to view PowerPoints? Um, and so we have this, uh, we have this drop down pop up. Um, the user can select open in QuickOffice and um, the document gets opened up. And I'll explain kind of the, the function calls in a little bit. Uh, same thing on Android. So Android uses a slightly different mechanism, but uh, the, the principle is really the same. So uh, again, you can say, hey, I have this PDF file. What applications do, does the user have installed uh, to, to open this PDF file up? So it's the same thing. You choose QuickOffice and, and it's available. Um, another example of uh, these intents on Android is uh, the, the send to uh, request. And so what send to allows you to do is, is have your application register to receive a file. So in this example, a user can take a photo from their, uh, from their Android tablet. So they take a photo. Um, they click a drop down menu to send the file to some other application. So box is registered on there. Um, we receive the file and then we can, we can upload it. And so, you know, there it is in the, uh, in the account. So a little bit more generically, on, on iOS you use something called a UI document interaction controller to pass content between applications. Uh, you can also register custom URL schemes. And these custom URL schemes can be something like, in our case, box colon slash slash. And if the web browser tries to load this URL scheme up um, or the mail application sees that URL scheme, if your application is registered, it'll actually make a call uh, to your app and pass in uh, the information that's contained within the URL to your app. And so it's a great way of bringing users to your native application from your website, from a partner's website, uh, or from an email. So you can just open the app right up. And so uh, there's a little bit more information on there. And then on Android, you can also have the custom URL schemes, but they have a slightly more powerful system than iOS in that uh, they make it possible to use something called an intents. And uh, an intent allows you to get a, a list of uh, apps or activities uh, that can perform certain ac actions uh, in your application. So those can be stuff like, like view, edit, get content, send. So it's a pretty powerful, uh, robust framework for communicating between activities and, and other applications on Android. So let's see. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about web APIs, and I think this is the, the more traditional um, set of APIs that uh, people um, think about when they think about cloud. So at Box, we've actually published our APIs, so they're open for anybody to have access to. Um, this makes it uh, really easy to make sure that our APIs are simple and they're unchanging, uh, and we get a lot of feedback from the, from the developer community, um, and it's a great way to make just content in general accessible uh, from our partner applications. Um, so diving in a little more specifically, so when you're building an API, you want to make sure that, uh, let's see, I'll start with the second bullet point first actually. So you want to publish a minimum set of parameters for each action that your application needs to take, and then kind of incrementally add optional parameters uh, as, you, as you need them. So start simple and then build out. Uh, you want to make sure also that in the login methods of your, uh, of your application, of your API, um, you want to make sure there's an easily revocable auth token. So you don't want to store your password on the user's device and then make them change it when they want to log out remotely. You want to provide some other mechanism. 
So what that looks like is if uh, your cloud service revokes the API key, the user is then logged out of the application and, and the data is wiped and they need to log back in again. Uh, so an example of this on Box, let's say you're logged into the app, uh, you're able to revoke the auth token um, from the website. And what that does is it prompts a log out of the user in the application. Um, so it's really important to decouple uh, the auth token from the password. And so some examples of web API technologies that you might want to check out. On iOS, there's a great open source uh, JSON parser at this URL. Um, and there's also a really good uploads library uh, at that URL that kind of helps you construct post requests and, and all of that good stuff. OK, so again, just the, the login information here. So I guess the one other point to mention is you should never save the password on the device, because if the phone gets jailbroken, it's really easy to, to figure out what the user's password is, which could be a huge security risk. And one of the login authentication um, schemes that helps you prevent this is OAuth. So OAuth actually allows you to request a, um, a web page, basically with login information from uh, a third party service or site. And at the end of kind of the whole routine, it'll pass you back that auth token. Uh, and then one final point about this, if you are publishing an open platform, uh, you should make sure that the tokens that you send out are application or device specific, because if somebody loses their phone, you shouldn't log them out across their computer and their tablets and the, the website as well. So it should be device specific and application specific. Um, some points about online offline access. So, you know, we all know that phones and tablets uh, can go in and out of internet connectivity all the time. So you can get on an airplane and you lose Wi-Fi. Um, you can drive through a tunnel and, and you lose connectivity. So the way that we've started thinking about this is everything on the server is, is the source of truth. And we never really assume connectivity. So whenever we render a view of what's on the server, we actually we make the call to the cloud service. We store it in an application cache, and wiping everything that was in the cache previously, and then we, then we display it. And what that means is that, let's say the connection goes down. If the connection goes down, you still have that cache, which you can display. And so um, from the cache, you get speed. So you don't have to hit the server every time you, you display a new view. And, uh, you also get the ability to have offline access later, uh, which is really useful. Let's see. Um, one more point, push notifications. Um, so we actually haven't implemented this yet because we're still trying to figure out exactly how to use them. Um, but these are a great way to get people back into your application if uh, they, weren't, uh, they weren't in it already. So, I would reserve these for kind of really important events uh, that uh, a user needs to go back into the application to, to see. You don't want to have too many notifications, though, because people get pissed off and just turn off access. Uh, so you won't be able to send them anymore. Um, so make sure you keep them at a small number and, uh, and high impact. And uh, just a quick screenshot on iOS 5 of what the, their new notification system looks like. It's, um, it's pretty slick. And actually, with the new notification system on iOS and with the notification system on Android, um, you actually can start to send more notifications because they're easier to ignore. So the, the last thing that I want to talk about are uh, in-app web views. And so here's an example of where we're using one. Uh, this, is our, this is our touchpad application, actually. And so when a user first registers for a, a new account on Box, we show them this screen. And what's inside the red box is actually uh, a web view rendered from our server. And so what this allows us to do is instead of having to recompile and rebuild the application and then resubmit it to, the, uh, to whatever app store we're, we're in, 
uh, we can change this on the server. And any changes that happen immediately get propagated to every installed app that's out there. And so these web views are really great for something that would be too complex to build in native application code. Um, in general, they're a little bit more low fidelity, so you wouldn't want to do animations or, or any, anything where you really need to get high fidelity performance out of the application. And uh, um, you're also able to change the content really easily. So, for example, here, you know, we're providing a, a new user experience. Let's say we add a new feature, a new functionality. It's really easy for us to go ahead and update it on the server without having to get people to download the application uh, another time. So it's a really handy trick for, for that type of uh, content. So just real quick how to. Um, when your app displays the web view, you have to give the web view uh, a web address. And this can either be a static page, you know, something dynamically generated. Uh, and um, you have the full interactivity of the Safari or, you know, whatever browser, the native browser is on your device. And more and more of them are coming, are becoming HTML5 compatible so you can do cool stuff like uh, cache the web pages so you only download changes uh, when they're available on the server. So that's a, a really cool um, set of functionality that you should look into uh, taking advantage of. So let's see. I think that's about it. So just to recap, uh, you should look at the cloud when you're starting to think about the entire user story. How does your app fit into this broader ecosystem of applications uh, that exist? So you know, for Box, that's people want to open a document in Box, edit it in Quick Office on their iPad, and have that go to somebody that's, um, you know, on a computer or a website somewhere else. Uh, for a game that you want to make social or, you know, some other product that you want to make social, uh, that might be a, a Facebook integration uh, or, or something like that. So people want to have their information accessible on Spotify and then later on in, um, you know, in a, in a game. There's a bunch of technologies available, so, you know, if you can't figure something out, there's probably an open source library somewhere uh, that'll help you with your connectivity. And um, a lot of times, bigger services will actually have uh, APIs that you can plug into. So, you know, for example, Twilio has a really cool API that allows you to send SMSs programmatically, um, make phone calls, stuff like that. Box also has an API if you want to do stuff with document storage uh, in the cloud. Um, so, you know, make sure to, to kind of browse around if you're looking at building your server component. And, uh, yeah, just in general, if you make your app more connected to the cloud, more connected to other applications, uh, your users will, will thank you. And a lot of times you'll, you'll see, you know, partners reciprocating. So they'll link to your app, you link to their app. Uh, and then one more thing again. This just happened this afternoon, so it's really exciting. Uh, we, we kicked off an offer for, uh, for the new iPhone launch. And so if you have a, an iPhone or an iPad, uh, you can go sign in and you'll get 50 gigs of, of free storage. So yeah, that's it. Any questions? Yeah, back there. Uh, I use Box extensively, in fact. Yeah. Uh, but the question I have is, what do you see uh, with iCloud coming? And most of the iOS developers are going to prefer iCloud mm -hmm. because of the obvious reasons. It's better integrated. Mm -hmm. uh, so for, for uh, I understand if, you, if you're using both Android and iOS, I don't know if iCloud is yeah. a better option for, for native apps. Do you see iCloud as a threat? So, yeah, iCloud is great if your application works on, on iOS only, and it works only within, uh, you know, your user's space. Uh, and, it, I mean, it's a fantastic backup solution, and they have fantastic libraries that, that make it really easy to back stuff up. The thing is, though, if you're looking to support iOS, Android, touchpad, Windows Phone 7, you know, like, the wide range of, of mobile devices. And if you're looking to provide support 
on the web for your service as well. Um, you really need to start looking at some of the other kind of platform agnostic solutions. And so, um, you know, iCloud's great for personal users on Apple products, but most people aren't, you know, pure, I, pure Apple users on, uh, on just Apple products. And, you know, for us, we're not only cross-platform, but we're also kind of cross-organization. So at, with Box, you can actually share content with other users and, and start to collaborate. And there's a very low probability that you're going to be in an in a enterprise or a company that just has Apple products. And so um, you know, we're still seeing a lot of adoption of our, uh, of our open box, of our APIs. We have hundreds of applications integrated. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. Does that, <laughs> does that kind of address the question? Yeah, I have another question. So do you also have uh, a web server hosting services like Google, App, Google Apps has? So what do you mean web server hosting? Like? As in hosting, hosting a server. Can I host a server on Box as yet? Or? No. I mean, we have the list of, of API calls you can make. Um, it's really easy to store content, collaborate con your users' content. Um, you know, leave comments, share files. Uh, there's kind of a whole list of, of options you, you can have to host, but the domain of the service really does need to be um, document-centric and business-centric. Thanks. So, yeah. So, yeah, go for it. Sure. <laughs> um, what about, like, a competition, or do you guys, uh, like, look at, like, Competition with like companies like Evernote, which are like mm -hmm. which do like note taking and like real time because there's like real time aspect here. It seems also in that sense and right. a bunch of. What do you guys have a competition strategy with them or versus other note based companies? Yeah. So we actually integrate with a bunch of those uh, note based companies, and so um, you know companies like Quick Office, Docs to Go. Um, you know, uh, various other like audio note taking apps, annotation apps. Um, so we integrate with all of them and we kind of want to be agnostic to that. We really provide a set of business uh, security and administrative oversight and collaborative, uh, you know, a collaborative layer on top of those basic documents. And so we're kind of agnostic to the, the note taking applications. I mean, we even have a, an integration with Google Docs. Um, and so, really, our service is about providing that administrative oversight for businesses, security for businesses, and then collaboration within a company. And uh, and so, we'd love to integrate with with more note taking apps. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You um, throw away the um, the documents on the mobile devices, but aren't, aren't now that the cellular carriers are charging more for? Data transfer isn't it our job as developers to reduce the amount of data? Right. So we actually do a lot uh, with with caching. So if you previewed a document or viewed a document previously, we'll ask the server, "Hey, did this document change?" We'll get a hash code of the file from the server um, and send that back up. And then if that hasn't changed, we won't re-download the file. We also allow you to kind of save files offline so that you know you're not going to have to download them later. So we're trying to do a lot around caching and making it really easy to not chew through all of your, uh, all of your bandwidth. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah. Absolutely. How do you handle multiple people editing the same file at the same time? So that's a good question. Um, so in general or, or on on the mobile devices or? Just like say I'm on the website, you're on your iPad mm -hmm. and we're on the same file. Right, so if we're, so we do have basic locking capabilities uh, which make it possible for if you're interacting with a really large group of people you can say hey this is my file, I want to lock it for 15 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour and not let anybody else upload changes to it. For the most part though what we've seen is that people will typically have uh, a, a limited number of users in a particular folder and they're interacting through comments, they're interacting through email, they're interacting in the same office or over the phone and for the most part people aren't stepping too much on other people's toes. Um, 
if that does happen though and somebody uploads a file and somebody uploads another version, uh, we also have a version history and you can kind of revert and reconcile amongst yourselves. So there's no sort of uh, continuous integration like Google Wave did for a while? No, that would be very cool though. Um, if, if anybody's working on, you know, an editor <laughs> that, that makes that happen, um, it'd be an awesome integration though, I think. Also, uh, your, the files have to be pretty big in size. Do you have any numbers on how much data you're transferring, stuff like that? Oh, in, in aggregate or just on a, a particular user's account? Yeah, just in aggregate. Yeah, I don't know those numbers. It's big. It's, I, I know that we're storing a lot of data. Um, is it, is it sure. taxing at all to the user though? I mean, how so, long does the download take? So it depends if you're on Wi-Fi or over 3G. Um, you know, 3G, for the most part, it's, it's about the, the latency and the call. So downloading actually proceeds pretty quickly. Um, but like I said earlier, you know, we're trying to do as much as we can, caching documents and saving documents. Uh, so that once you download it for the first time, you don't have to worry about subsequent downloads. So. Um, do you have anything if you have all the computer or uh, tablet is in the same network? Do you have a uh, LAN sync up before you call to the cloud? Say it one more time. Uh, do you have any function can do LAN sync up? So you don't, you can sync up individual tablet or computer instead of sync up to cloud and try to save some bandwidth. Oh, so like if if you have two computers on the same wireless network or the same network. Do you have to send it to the cloud or can it like bounce behind the router or something like that? Uh, we don't currently have that system. We're kind of, the, the way that we think about it is, you know, the cloud is, is the source of truth and everybody kind of either pushes or pushes to or pulls from the cloud. Uh, so we're not, yeah, we're not really doing anything um, along those lines right now. How do your customers think about um, organization and file system? Have you found that they are just replicating their intranet uh, mm -hmm. into box or are they taking a different approach? So I think it, it depends on the use case, right? So a lot of times companies will move to box from, you know, an FTP or just an internal file system. And a lot of times, yeah, they will just replicate all of that content. Uh, Box does enable different use cases though, and so over time people start using it to collaborate with the outside world. So um, sharing documents with clients, uh, you know, providing access where um, they, they wouldn't normally um, be able to provide access or be more difficult to provide access. So um, I don't know, I, I think it's a mishmash. Um, yeah. Um, for offline editing, uh, Google recently announced that they will be adding features for that mm -hmm. uh, on Google Docs. Uh, so do you plan on relying on those for offline editing or have your uh, own sort of functionality for that? Do you, do you mean offline editing on the computer or server or device? On the device. So like, this is another one of those where we're letting the kind of developer community address it. Uh, you, know, you can actually edit your documents on Quick Office or on Docs to Go, uh, on Google, I guess. Um, and then when you're back online, you can upload it back to the cloud. It's kind of a clunky process right now that we're trying to, to make better. Um, but yeah, there's not a really great solution that, that we're working on. Um, it's one of the things that we're looking for, for partners to solve. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. All right, anything else? We good? Okay. Thanks, everybody.